Hello, I'm Jennifer Morfitt, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. When Prairie Appreciation Day started 10 years ago, a few people gathered south of Olympia to better understand and appreciate this unique habitat. 10 years later, volunteers are needed to assist with parking. The acres of western Washington prairie lands are unique, but they are getting smaller. Well, most people appreciate prairies because they're beautiful, and they're particularly beautiful at this time of year when you've got all the blooming wildflowers shooting stars, camas. Camas is probably one of the keynote flowers because when it comes up it's just a profusion of blue, kind of a blue carpet that lays out over the prairies, whether it's a mounded prairie or a flat prairie. But often in our prairies you've got a surrounding in oak trees and that's somewhat related to the fire history that maintained prairies in the past and oaks being very tolerant of fire and the fire would burn the prairie and it would go into the forest a little ways before dying out and that would kill conifer trees, but it, the oaks would be able to sustain through time. So you've got these beautiful oak trees, beautiful bark, the color, the texture, the incredible growth fo form with the big uh, limbs that kind of swoop out and are gnarly and twisted. About 90% of our prairies, uh, at least what was known to exist about 150 years ago, are really gone. I mean, they're either in homes or they've been changed from agricultural uses, grazing, so that they don't have the native plants anymore. It's pretty much, you know, pasture grasses and the like. And that prairie, which still has the native plants, is very rare. Um, Scott's broom has been a huge problem. That's probably what we're fighting the hardest because those prairies that didn't get built on or tilled for agriculture or grazed by livestock tended to be invaded by Scott's broom, which just grew up and formed a dense canopy that shades out all other plants. A lot of effort is really going into conserving, restoring prairies. We're actually buying prairie lands. We're mowing Scott's broom, we're using herbicides, we're using fire, prescribed burning, we're um, doing a lot of different kinds of things, in fact trying to learn what needs to be done, uh, propagating plants in some cases to try and restore prairie from scratch, and um, just really trying to do a better job of stewardship and management so we can retain these prairies uh, into the distant future. There's a number of species that we would lose if we didn't have our prairies. We would not have a butterfly called the Taylor's Checker Spot, a beautiful little orange and cream and black butterfly. The uh, Streaked Horn Lark, um, a prairie bird that has a beautiful song, not necessarily loud or something that you would take notice of unless you were really paying close attention. A couple of other butterflies, the Puget Blue that uh, lays its eggs on lupin, um, species, various kinds of insects. The prairies have a lot of insect life that it can be found nowhere else. On the same day some of you appreciated the prairie, thousands more went to Grays Harbor for the 10th annual Shorebird Festival. This musty event now attracts thousands of bird watchers and nature enthusiasts each spring who want a good view of the shorebirds along the mud flats of Grays Harbor. The festival covers three days and events include vendors with crafts, books, and artwork, a keynote speaker this year was Dr. Dennis Paulson, a noted shorebird expert and author. Lectures, workshops, and field trips always cover a wide range of topics as visitors enjoy the natural areas of the region. Grays Harbor County Commissioner Al Carter and the Mayor of Hoquiam, Jack Durney, view the growing number of community events and the sponsorships as an indication of a healthy and expanding community-based event. Festival planners estimate that several hundred thousand dollars are spent during the weekend as birders search out the local wildlife. Now, here are other places you can see Washington's wildlife in the coming weeks.
The agency's Eastern Washington Mule Deer Study continues with crews recapturing radio collar does for their yearly health checkups. We're out here, we're catching some more deer, which is part of our ongoing mule deer project. Um, we're in our fifth year, and uh, um, we're catching deer with a helicopter. We're uh, working them up, scoring their body condition, both manually and as well as using the ultrasound. We got a good crew of volunteers and some students out here this afternoon, and uh, things are going really well. And basically what we're doing, we're, you could call it a health check if you, uh, in, in part, but basically it's, we're measuring their physical condition coming out of the winter as they're entering the, entering the spring and the fawning season. What kind of condition are these deer in? What's their body fat level? Uh, how thin are they? And whether they're pregnant or not. And if they are pregnant, how many fawns they've got on board. You know, we, we've got a lot of folks helping us. This is really a ter terrific opportunity for volunteers of all ages, from from uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, and adults. We've got a lot of folks here from the Inland Northwest Wildlife Council, and a few folks from the Mule Deer Foundation. We've we've had a we had a poor growing season last summer, and uh, a relatively dry dry fall, a mild winter. But these deer are, most of them are, are pretty thin. Um, they're, uh, they're skinnier than, than deer that we've measured at other times in the spring. If you want to use the over 600 statewide access areas we maintain for the public, it's time to get your vehicle use permit, if you don't already have one. The annual cost is only $10, and you get a lot for your money. Uh, what you're going to get for your money is access to water. You're going to be able to launch your boat or your jet ski or your kayak, inflatable, whatever it might be. And uh, you can take a look at some of the wildlife that's around Washington. Here locally, we have eagles and osprey. Uh, and all kinds of wildlife to look at, uh, take photographs of it if, if, if you like, or, or simply watch the habitat. Uh, we're in close proximity to a major urban area, and yet we've been able to preserve a lot of it, and it's all here for you to see. There, there might be some confusion about, uh, is it just Washington residents that are required to have it? And the answer to that is that everyone that uses our sites, our access sites, is required to have the vehicle use permit. That's everyone. This $10 comes back to, uh, to our users through increased maintenance and uh, uh, availability of our access sites. We use that money to buy gravel uh, for additional pumping of toilets if that's required <clears throat> and to take care of additional maintenance needs that uh, otherwise not be, we might not be able to take care of immediately. If you don't buy one and we encounter the vehicle that doesn't have a, an access or the uh, vehicle use permit, anywhere visible to us, uh, we do issue a citation. It's a notice of infraction, and the, in the amount on this infraction is $66 initially. We'd prefer that people be aware of the requirement and that they go ahead and get their uh, vehicle use permits, and everybody has a good time out here at, at our uh, access sites, and, and then we're all happy that way. Dumping of, of garbage and, and excessive littering, of course, is a problem we have here at our access sites, and it's something we watch real close. Uh, if anybody ever does see any of that activity going on, we would very much appreciate uh, that information getting, getting to the enforcement officers. Uh, the key information, of course, is license plate numbers, uh, vehicle descriptions, and when it took place and what you saw. And if you can get that information to us, then usually we can be pretty, uh, pretty quick to respond to that. And, of course, any time we do catch people dumping on our access sites, the, uh, the fines and penalties can be pretty significant. We manage these areas for people's recreation and for the opportunity to have uh, a variety of uh, enjoyable experiences that involve wildlife of varying degrees, and that's the intent. And unfortunately, we have to have regulations to uh, help that, that purpose, and uh, we hope that everybody can follow those regulations and follow the rules so that everybody can have a chance to enjoy these areas 
and uh, that that makes my job all the easier. Um, giving someone a citation uh, isn't uh, as important as as people having the chance to enjoy the their experience here, and, and that's the priority. Washington's favorite sport. More will go fishing this weekend than attend Mariner games. We love watching the Mariners, but fishing is a sport we can play and not just watch. Here are a few places to go play. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.